Great. As people are coming in, uh, we're so happy to have you. Welcome, welcome. Um, we're going to start in about a minute or two, um, but the chat is open and we would love for you to drop uh, your location in the chat. Um, so again, my name is Tracy, uh, she, her. Um, I am uh, in Oakland um, and would love for folks to drop their locations in the chat as well. And as we get more people coming in, welcome, welcome. My name is Tracy. We're gonna start in about a minute. Um, and if you will drop your location in the chat, the chat is live and we would love uh, to hear from folks. Excellent. Um, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, Tracy, she, her in Oakland. So excited to have folks on. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen and we're going to get this party started. Great, so welcome to um, our teaching on the legacy of the Panthers hosted by the People's Coalition uh, for Safety and Freedom. Um, again, my name is Tracy, uh, she, her, um, and I am at um, Action Center on Race and the Economy or ACRE. Next slide. So the People's Coalition um, for Safety and Freedom, also known as People's Coalition or PCSF, uh, we are a group of base building and member led grassroots organizations uh, that work for policy to advance uh, racial justice. Uh, we are mostly black and queer led organizations. Um, and we represent a cross section of communities impacted by systems of criminalization and incarceration. Um, and we are committed to transforming this, the justice system so that folks actually receive justice and redefining public safety. Next slide. So just a little bit about us, our steering committee, um, BYP 100, C, uh, Center for Popular Democracy, Baji, Dream Defenders, Leadership Conference, Law for Black Lives, uh, Just Leadership uh, USA, Policy Link, Justice Teams Networks, um, National Council for Incarcerated Girls, and obviously I said I repped Acre. Um, so thank y'all so much for being here on behalf of all of our organizations. Um, next slide. So just to let you know what we're gonna be doing tonight, um, we're gonna do a little bit of introduction, which I've done. Uh, we're gonna do a little grounding. Um, I cannot bring folks together without grounding us in something similar. So we're um, experiencing this from the same place. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about who we are. Um, and then we're going to, um, there's a viewing guide for Judas and the Black Messiah um, that will drop for you so that as you are watching, you have something to look for. Um, there's going to be an amazing panel on the legacy of Chairman Fred Hampton and the, um, the Black Panther Party. Um, and then we're gonna talk about how you can get involved and join our people's process. Um, and following all of that is when we'll show the, uh, show the film. Next slide. Great. So as I said, I want folks to ground with me. Um, so I want you, um, if you are comfortable to close your eyes um, or not, just relax your gaze. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through something with me. Um, so have you ever slowed down for just a few seconds and thought about a great day? So I want you to do that with me right now. Think about that day. Who's around you? What did you do? What does it feel like? What are you seeing right now? What does it smell like? And I want you to sit with that image for a moment. Now I'm gonna ask you to come back to me. 
And I want you to drop in the chat um, just what that what that was for you. Um, who who was around? What did it sound like? What were some of your favorite places? I want us to get a little interactive up in here um, and just really tell us what all of that meant for you. Yeah, sunshine, food, and family. Come on, I know other people saw things. What else did y'all see? Yes, the sun is out. Absolutely. Um, so that's what I think about. And I want people to continue to think about that, continue to drop those uh, experiences in the chat. But that's what I think about when I do this work. I think about green space and kids playing in fire hydrants that they probably shouldn't have opened. Um, I think about the taste of barbecue and my mom telling her favorite story that I've heard a bunch, but a little bit too loudly, but I listen over and over because I love her laugh. And that's what we're trying to think about, right? Um, but, I, but I can tell you what, I, what you probably didn't see. You probably didn't see police because true public safety comes from what you saw on your great day right? It comes from investing in resources and repair, not in policing, incarceration, and surveillance. Next slide. So our goal at PCSF is um, to dismantle and replace racist, harmful, and punitive policies that have fueled the crisis of criminalization and incarceration facing the United States with policies and budgets that invest in communities and decarcerate our country. So that's a big goal. Um, next slide. There are many, many ways to do that, but the way, the way that we are entering that work is through the 1994 Crime Bill. So the 94 Crime Bill was uh, passed in September of 1994. It was uh, signed by President Bill Clinton um, at the time. Um, it was written by current President Joe Biden. It was voted on by uh, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, and it was voted on by Senate Majority Leader um, Chuck Schumer. So as you can tell, we have a problem, y'all. Um, and so some of the major components, this is by no means everything, but some of the things that it did was implement three strike rules and mandatory minimum sentences. Um, it did truth in sentencing, laws, in sentencing laws and incentives. The COPS program, which we are still feeling the effects of right now today in our city budgets, um, was established and it gave 19 billion, billion with a B, $19 billion to expand policing into US cities. It also gave $10 billion in subsidies to expand state prisons, um, ended Pell Grants for folks that were locked up, um, and also included the Violence Against Women Act and Federal Assault Weapons Ban. Next slide. So I want to give you this, uh, this quote from uh, Didi from BYP 100, who says, when we talk about defunding the police, it is always about negotiating uh, negotiations that we have to make. But we don't have those same conversations when we defund education, defund healthcare, defund the services and programs our communities need. The police continue to have what they need and our communities do not. So what is more possible when we have what we need? A world that, that doesn't rely on exploitation and violence. Next slide. And so I'm going to toss it over to my amazing colleague, Alex Goodwin, who is going to be moderating a panel discussion for us on the legacy of the Panthers. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Alex Goodwin. I'm a senior organizer at, at Acre with Tracy. Um, I use she and her pronouns. Um, I'm really excited uh, to do this panel today. Um, and so what I'm going to ask of our panelists, Jalen, um, Jamal, and Marbre, if we can, uh, first, I would like each of y'all to introduce yourself name, pronoun, and organization. And then if you could describe the work you do and what brought you into it. Um, and we'll stick with this order um, throughout the panel. So we'll go Jalen and then Jamal and Marbre. Um, so once again, the, the sort of check-in, we love a check-in question. Um, the check-in, if you could share your name, pronoun, and organization, and then how would you describe the work you do and what brought you into it? Um, and we'll start with you, Jalen. Sure. For sure. Thank you, Alex. Um, my name is Jalen. 
I don't like to use they, them pronouns or no pronouns. Um, and the work I do, shit, it's really self-work. And you know, self-work is community work, right? Self-love and um, sustainability for myself, right? Through through the mutual aid, through housing justice, through gun violence interruption and prevention. Um, so that looks like, you know, talking with my cousins and my brothers who are, you know, in these streets and are out here, you know, acting upon what they believe is revolution, right? Because I think a lot of times we don't talk about how, you know, a lot of our people are actually revolutionaries. We just don't have the right tools to, you know, utilize them. So I'm just making sure that people have the tools to utilize their own skills for revolution and then the access to information, the access to love and care um, and the access to people who are genuinely concerned about, you know, their well-being. So me, I'm always concerned about the well-being of my people because I want um, us to create a community where that's, you know, where that's standard. So yeah, that's the work I do. Thanks, Jalen. Can you shout out your organization? We'll yeah, shout out to Good Kids Mad City. You know, Good Kids Mad City 18 on uh, GKMC 18 on Instagram, Twitter, all that. Thank you, thank you. And I would like to hand it over to Jamal. Peace and power to the people, everyone. Jamal Joseph, he, him, we. And the collective we will get into more when we talk about the legacy of Fred Hampton and the Black Panther Party. I am a Black Panther veteran. We don't call ourselves former Panthers. Uh, joined the Panther Party when I was 15, went to prison as a member of the New York Panther 21 at 16. Former political prisoner. Um, spent close to 10 years in prison. I'm a professor at Columbia University in film. My organization is Impact Repertory Theater. And so young people come together using arts and activism to create work, but also to do change in the community. And so we are an active group of artivists. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Margaret, if you could introduce yourself. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for holding this space. And I'm really um, honored and excited to be among this company. I'm a big fan um, of both of you all's organizations and work. My name is Marbray. I use she and her pronouns. I'm with Law for Black Lives, which is a network of over 6,000 lawyers and legal workers who are committed to thinking about how do we use the tools of the law to dismantle these systems. And so we work and mobilize to protect and defend Black liberation movements across the country. Uh, we work to transform the legal field and transform the laws and systems that keep our people down. So I'm super honored to be here. Great, and uh, we're excited to, to talk with the three of you today. Um, so Jalen, this first question is for you. Um, it's easily forgotten or glossed over just how young Fred Hampton was and how young many of the other Panthers were at the height of their organizing. I think you know, people still feel that sort of shock when we hear right that Fred Hampton was 21 when he was murdered by CPD. So what kind of impact do you think that sort of like forgetting has on our organizing um, in relation to like age and, and the work that we do. Thank you. Um, first I'll say, yeah, like one, people don't even know that Fred Hampton had the feds on him, police on him since elementary school. Like he was bridging, you know, that, that next communities and black communities together in his schools, you know, so they started tapping his phones a minute ago. Um, and all of that is to say, um, I don't think it's forgetting. I think it's very purposeful. We live in a world where people want us to burn ourselves out. Um, I'm 20 years old right now, right? Um, I live two blocks from where Fred Hampton was at 21. So it's a lot of like Sankofa to look at the past to be like, what was going on during this time that I can navigate differently now? But I don't think people are forgetting. People want young Black people, young Indigenous people, um, at, you know, in these nonprofit organizational complexes, right, um, to to extort their own energy and to exp expand their energy, um, fighting for liberation in ways that they, you know, deem fit. But in actuality, it's it's a very purposeful thing. People want in the in the movie we cast Daniel Kaluuya so that people can think that Fred Hampton was older than he really was. Fred Hampton was a baby. Fred Hampton was known for his dimples and smiling all the time and bringing cheer everywhere he went. He wasn't supposed to be a martyr, right? So it's I think that you know when we talk about martyrdom, when we talk about a lot of our revolutionaries being called to martyrdom. Um, through rebellion, right? Through what we see happening on these blocks, through what we see happening in these streets. It's all one and the same. Um, so I think, you know, young organizers, we always got to keep our guard up because um, me personally, there's there's a lot of times where I'm I'm looking like, okay, GKMC, we got to do this, we got to do this and this. And then it's like, wait, where 
we're not in any position to do any of that. We don't have the money. We don't have the means, the experience. We need to just chill. You know, we need to just love on ourselves and our community. So I think that that's kind of the impact that that has on, you know, our organizing now. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to take the next question over to you, Jamal, um, to talk a little bit about the film. Um, so I think, you know, the film received some warranted pushback, um, especially around like the cost and what some of that money could be used for. I think we're also going to drop a link um, around supporting the Hampton House. Um, I would be curious to know your thoughts, if you could speak to the importance of owning our own stories, but also like owning our own solutions. Yeah, it's really important. Um, and and I'll, I'll come at this um, as an organizer, but also someone who's a filmmaker. I'm a, a writer, director, and producer. Um, <clears throat> there were things in, in, in uh, Judas and the Black Messiah that we hadn't seen in other Panther films. And I was grateful for that. Political education, uh, respect to the role of sisters. There was a scene where the Panthers were just in the car, just laughing. And we laughed a lot because we were young, but we were joyful in what we did, even though we fully expected to be arrested, to be killed. It wasn't a surprise to us uh, that they were coming at us. But the film in terms of, of, uh, of the cause, it's a Warner Brothers film. And they've always for years wanted to make a black Donnie Brasco. So they talk a lot and give equal balance to O'Neill and the FBI. Uh, so if I could just talk about story real estate for a second, it would be amazing to see more of what that work did. And it would be amazing to see in terms of controlling things in our community to talk about Jalen was talking about resources and we're talking about controlling our resources. The Black Panther Party started a breakfast program with no money, but we knew that we had value and resources in the community. We would go to community centers and churches and ask if we use the dining room. We would go to stores in the neighborhood and ask for donations of food. We would put up a flyer and it was no shortage of hungry kids. And by the way, the program came out of recognizing a need that you know, they said our kids are disrupted, they don't pay attention. And the Panthers said, you know, uh, we had younger brothers and sisters, some were young parents. Maybe the problem is if you have a teacher saying three apples plus two apples equal five ap apples and a kid's stomach is growling, they can't pay attention. So with no permission and no grant money, we started a breakfast program. You'd open a site, you'd have 10 kids the first week, by the end of the month, 100 kids. It's estimated that at the height of the breakfast program, this grassroots organization was feeding 50,000 kids na nationally. Now we were using it to educate the kids about the history, to point out the contradictions to the parents. Here we are in the late 60s and America, the richest nation on earth, knows that fit to figure out how to put a man on the moon, but they can't put some eggs and cereal in front of a child. Why is that? And what do we have to do to change that collectively? So the film, and you know, we hope we can do better. I have a, we're working on a series about the New York Panther 21 uh, uh, based on my book, Panther Baby. And built into that model needs to be funding for political prisoners, for community programs, for Panther veterans who are now aging. A lot of people, listen, we talk about the fact that we were young, you know, we were, you know, Mumia I think was, 14, I think he beat me by a year, I was 15. I walked into the Panther office looking at all the cool older brothers and sisters. Afeni Shakur was one of the first people I saw, but she was 21 years old, right? So, but on the other end of the spectrum, we have Panthers in their 60s and their 70s and now, and people who grassroots have made this dynamic sacrifice who are struggling. What about our aging activists and our aging political prisoners? What about the care that we, uh, that we want to give in our communities for people going through all kinds of post-traumatic stress and trauma. So feeding mind, body, and spirit. So we need to uh, challenge folks who are already established in the industry and for young filmmakers and young writers, directors, young entrepreneurs, just to know that, they, that it is important to give to these community efforts to start to create funding sources so that in the spirit of the people's survival programs, of the 60s. And by the way, 
the idea of banding together is not something invented by the Black Panther Party. I was talking about this earlier. We had rent parties in our communities when people were about to be evicted. We didn't let that happen. We had college parties to raise money to, to, to get people out. We always knew how to come together. And I'm coming back to that we that we talked about to have what we call survival pending liberation. Thank you so much um, for that. Uh, Marvre, I'm gonna kick it over to you. Um, we're talking a little bit about um, resources, maybe the lack of or, or um, black people's continued creativity to create the things that we need. Um, and, and we've talked a little bit within the coalition space just about how I think some of the things that the Panthers experienced really laid the groundwork for the 94 crime bill to be possible. Um, and so my question to you is how does repealing the 94 crime bill continue or relate to the legacy of the Black Panther Party? And what does it mean to change the material conditions for Black people um, and incarcerated people right now in 2021? Yeah, thank you for that. So I think, I mean, I think two major points. One is understanding the history around the Black Panther Party, around building Black power and the response by the state to criminalize Black folks and Black activists as really the precursor to the 94 Crime Bill. So the 94 Crime Bill is a one of a series of bills passed in the 1990s um, under the Clinton administration with bipartisan support. There was about criminalizing black and brown communities and activism. And so we see the welfare reform bill as part of that, the Adoption Safe Families Act bill, the immigration bill, all of these really were kind of the end and capstoned an era that was about increasing penalties, increasing police, increasing jails and cages in order to really police, criminalize um, and cage black and brown people. And I think we see this really clearly in the history of the Black Panther Party that over and over again as black folks um, came into their own around their politics, demanded political power, demanded, as Fred Hatton said, revolution, not just reform. The response by the state was an immediate um, criminalization of that. And they grasped for laws and ways to do that. And through the 80s and 90s, we saw the creation of new laws, new penalties, um, expanded police powers that allowed them to do that with more and more ease. And so I think we can understand the black power movements of the 60s um, and the 70s as really precursors, as a grounding of the 94 crime bill. I think we have to understand the 94 crime bill was not an attempt to reduce quote unquote crime. That's not what any of these costs or bills have been about. It really was an attempt to control and regulate black and brown activism. Um, and so I think that's really important to name that understanding the origins of these bills, um, again, not in safety. And as I think Tracy did a really good job, we all know the police don't actually keep us safe. That's not the function of them. Um, but locating the increase in criminalization and in funding in Black revolution, in the threat of Black power. So that's one, I think it's also important to name. And one thing that I think is really clear in the film and also in, in in veteran Panthers experiences is there's this mythology that we're seeing even now with Biden talking about kind of community policing and all of this kind of this reference like the good old days when, when police were like good people and close to communities as this, this kind of like golden era of the 50s and 60s was somehow police were like different in form or in function. And the reality is that police have never, ever, ever been here to solve our community. So the origins of policing and slave patrols, the use of policing in the civil rights movement to, to torture, to, to um, infiltrate, to destroy movement is not an aberration from the utility of police. It is in fact in line with the themes and the purpose of them. And so throughout history, in the 60s, in the 40s, in the 20s, in the 1800s, police have always been used to um, um, reduce and to, to really um, stop Black power and Black movement building and to really stop class solidarity and movement building. And so I think it's important that we name and that we, we really trace that history that, that what we saw, um, the execution of Fred Hampton by the, the police in Chicago is not outside of the realm of what police do in this country. That it is a continuation and escalation of their roles and their job and their function um, throughout history. And so I think it's important to name that too, that the experiences of Black Panthers, whether it's Cointel Pro and the Federal government, Government, all the cooperation of, of state police and local police in repressing movement, in destroying lives, in caging people, again, really is part of a long legacy that is about the root purpose. Hello. 
<laughs> um, about the root purpose um, of policing and of caging and of the cost of state um, in this country. And so I think um, to the question of kind of what shifting this paradigm looks like today, I think it looks the same. Um, and I think that Mr. Joseph touched on this. It looks like political education. It looks like power shifting. And what the Panthers were fighting for and what was unique and what was like, what was the threat was to the state was a shift in power, not just in rhetoric or services, but an actual shift in who gets to decide how things happen, how resources are allocated. That at the heart of, of the fight was one about power, not just about kind of reform. And so I think that fight continues. And so much of the people's process and the work that PCSF is doing is on how do we not just change the conditions, but also the systems in which those conditions exist? How do we shift power from decision makers and the same people who made these laws to destroy us into the hands of the folks who are most impacted by it? And how do we do that through political education so that folks realize and, and eyes are open to the way in which the kind of the current state is meant to destroy and undermine our power and our power building? Here he is. If I can, if I can very quickly, that, that was powerful and brilliant. Uh, Everything we've talked about so far is a point in the Black Panther Party 10 point program. And point number eight of the program was we want uh, all Black and oppressed people held in city, state, federal, county, and military prisons to be uh, to be released. And it's preceded by the point that the Panthers are probably best known for. Point number seven, we want an immediate end to police brutality. But even going back to what uh, what Sister Tracy did when she was uh, uh, you know, having us visualize for a moment and settle for a moment. Point number one is that we want freedom. We want the power to determine the destiny of our community. And it goes on to talk about housing. It goes on to talk about employment. Point number five talks about education. So this is not a, a bad lens. As we're talking about the Panthers and Fred Hampton, the thing that we were taught is that go out and you need to be in the community working on one of those points in the 10 point program. And by the way, all black men and women exempt from military service. So when you look at what happened with the draft movement, when you look at that, that call for people, uh, you know, not to get early parole, not to be, cons you know, to consider, but to be released because this, because the system is unfair. It's, it's contained therein. And, and that's why we see the kind of uh, response to the Black Panther Party not only being destroyed by COINTELPRO, uh, 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 but sister, as you were pointing out, the rollback on those policies because it had taken a foothold in the consciousness of the community and of activists and of policymakers. Thank you so much um, for adding that. Um, I would like to spend the last 15 minutes um, of us talking about what the work actually looks like in practice um, and on the So I'm gonna kick it over to Jalen um, to ask if you could share about some of the campaigns that y'all are working on here in Chicago and you know what are some of the parallels and maybe differences that you see between your work now and um, within the time of the Black Power Movement and the Black Panthers? For sure. Thank you for the question. Um, and thank you to everybody who spoke. Y'all, wow. Just the knowledge that I just got in today. Thank y'all. Um, so right now we're placing the Peace Book Ordinance. The Peace Book Ordinance would take $36 million or 2% of CPD's $1.8 billion budget, Chicago Police Department, their budget, to allocate funds into our community in, a, in an itemized way that we would be able to work with community-based organizations to have a template to end gun violence to end all violence, domestic abuse, substance abuse, class abuse, the way that we are expropriated and extorted in our communities, right? Um, and that, right? So we would take this 36 million, working with families of gun violence, or families of us, uh, uh, victims of gun violence, excuse me, um, right? So working with families, giving them money to sustain, to live, right? Getting people housing, getting people therapy. Um, and then finally using the non-aggression pact that was championed by Fred Hampton and those ideals similarly to bring the gangs together to unite um, and with, with a strategic plan, right, that would regulate city funds. So for instance, let's say the, the right now, right, Peace Book, we, we don't have funding. So we, what we've been doing, like, you know, um, the Black Panthers did was we stand outside and we make sure that people are resourced. So we've been standing on 51st and Calumet in the Bronzeville community um, for the past 32 Thursdays. Um, and today, we, we were outside right after yesterday, there was a homicide right on the block that we stand on. Um, and then there was another shooting today, three blocks away from where we were. So, um, you know, I don't know what it was like for the Panthers back then with the same shooting, with the same violence going on. Um, but it, like Fred Hampton said, it is, it is ground zero for a revolution right now, right? We have um, all of the raw materials, right? 
uh, to work with. So mutual aid, right, and peace book. So peace book would, you know, continue the mutual aid programs we have that get people food, um, but also, you know, use restorative justice in schools to solve these problems before the kids get a gun, right? We are not under the assumption that violence happens just when people get a gun, right? Why do people have access to guns? Why do people have 50 caliber bullet guns on these streets of Chicago with laser beams on them, right? We didn't bring that in here. We didn't bring crack cocaine in here. We didn't bring heroin in here, right? We were subjugated from not being able to, you know, get into the capitalist economy. So then we had to create our own community, right? Through the means of subsistence we had, right? Which was nothing. So um, I think that's a parallel. I think um, you're looking at the oligarchy. I mean, shit, like I live two blocks from where Fred Hampton is. And I swear to God, it looks the same. It looked the same. We have one grocery store in three square miles. We have no leisurely activities. We don't have any theaters. We don't have any gymnasiums. We don't have any auditoriums. We don't have none of that, right? So that's what also the Peace Book is trying to build. We're trying to create an audience through the city that um, pays you to commission art projects, right? So art installations, murals, songs, right? We understand a lot of this violence is happening through the psychological and through the psychical, meaning what's in our psyche. So the music that we listen to, right? We talking about, oh, I'm dissing him, he dead. And, and fuck your homie, he dead. That, that's real songs in Chicago that people are singing right now. Right. And that's that's doing the white man's job for him. Right. But at the same time, we can still spin that. We can still not criminalize people. We can still erase the gang database and use the community organizations that are street organizations to actually protect against the police like the Panthers did in the 60s and 70s. Right. When we're looking at how organized crime really officiated the black people, the Puerto Ricans, right, the young lords, the maniac Latin disciples, the black peace stones, black peace stone rages, black Panthers, all one and the same, just had different you know, dominions of how they were operating. So I think, you know, when we, like was said, bridge everybody together, when we leave no stone unturned, right? When we have everybody in mind, when we are having trans people, queer people, disabled people, people with fat bodies, people who are not from America, people who, we need to have everybody in mind, right? I um, mean, that's what the Peace Book is trying to do in, in the West Side and the South Side, right? Where we have been starved, where we have been plundered, where we've been pillaged by this um, society and specifically Lori Lightfoot in the past couple months, but in the couple years, uh, Right now, she just gave 285 million of our $403 million in COVID relief money to CPD, while she just also increased speeding light tickets to get more black people to pay uh, fines in the city to incriminate more people. Um, and meanwhile, we got people talking about they abolished cash bail, like we're supposed to be happy about that. Um, no, they threw the word abolish in there so that we would try to get tired, right? No, we until we abolish the prison system, until we abolish the police, um, and then abolish the idea that Everything has to be abolished and nothing is gonna replace it. This is the alternative, right? Having people who look like you, having your little cousins, having your little sisters and your little brothers being able to walk to school, to go to the park, to have that day that was visualized at the beginning of this conversation. We do not need police for that. We do not need prisons. We don't need courts. We don't need landlords for that because they're all in bed together. So that's what we're working on the Peace Book Ordinance, not just 36 million, we need $10 trillion, goddammit, because the gun violence is not gonna stop just because we take guns out of people's hands. As long as guns are around, it's always gonna happen. But when we have people feel resourced, when people feel like they can talk to somebody instead of acting on impulse, and we have people who are eating and not popping ecstasy three days a week to self-medicate from this trauma, and we have people who are not drinking into early comatosis, and we have people who are not experiencing HIV and AIDS and dying at you know alarming rates in this city while you know white people are getting vaccinated in this city for coronavirus, come on now. Give us the 36 million. We want the 36 million, not just for us, for everybody in Chicago who was fighting for abolition. Um, and that's the parallel to the Black Panthers, baby. We are here as the Panthers, as the Cubs, as whoever we need to be to continue the legacy. That's that. Period. Thank you so much, Jalen. If y'all don't right know on. now, the young Bow people to the got people. it. <laughs> Look, right on, you know. Thank you so much. Um, mm. Uh, I'm going to, for this next question, um, pass to you, Jamal, if you could also share about some of your work, what needs you're meeting in your community, um, and how you are organizing around these things. So I, 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 I see my work inspired by the African griot. The griot was the storyteller who uh, sat in the center of the village under a tree called the Bao Bao tree. And the griot's job was to uh, was to entertain the tribe, but to educate the tribe. And education meant knowing the history, knowing the past, and what that meant for the future. So if you were a griot that uh, was very academic and had all the facts, uh, but you were boring, 
you know, the young people would be like, um, you know, I'm going to the next village. I, you know, let's go swimming. I already had my nap. By the same token, if you were Rio and you your beats were hot and your rhymes were popping, but your information wasn't right, people would call you out. They'd be standing back and say that, you know, that 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 Griot's talking about, you know, on that hunt that um say who killed that lion. Uh, but I was there. That was his little sister Keisha. So you had to do both. So the work that I do in uh, uh, in in um, uh, both my own work, but especially the work that I'm doing, mentoring uh, uh, young people from the community, my students at Columbia, is to challenge us to use these mediums, to use these very platforms to educate and to agitate, uh, to inspire people to, if the, if the answers are not there, but at least to, to ask the right questions. Um, you know, I'm also actively in, involved with the uh, Black Panther Alumni Association, and we're working around political prisoners, and we're working around defunding, and we're working around, uh, you know, passing the torch and whatever we can to connect uh, progressive young folks. Um, you know, so th so this is important work. I I, I want to talk just a second about the Rainbow Coalition that Fred Hampton built. It's important to know that Fred coined that term. A lot of people think Jesse Jackson did because he saw that it was working and he used it. But it was Fred Hampton that dared to walk up into places where no one else dared. It's in the film, but you have to know that he went, he felt that the Black Panther Party, there was no place in Chicago that the People's Army couldn't go because we weren't fighting for turf, we were fighting for the people. Fred was also brilliant. In the words of Malcolm X, and there's, you know, and there's a scene where he's repeating the words of Malcolm X, you have to organize people around their needs, not around their differences. So what I like to pass on here and what I like to say to young organizers is that you can organize around ideas if people are comfortable in, in that space where they're living a life of the mind, where they can read, where they can hear you, where they can debate. But in a life of crisis and trauma, you have to organize people around their needs. So if you want to talk about freedom, justice, and liberation, freedom to someone that hasn't eaten is a meal. Liberation to someone that is, in a, that is homeless, sleeping on a park bench, or public transportation is a warm, dry, safe place to rest their heads. Justice to someone that's not getting medical care is compassionate care and relief. This didn't exist. This is why one of the keystones of what Fred did, along with, uh, 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 along with, 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 uh, with young Doc, um, uh, who got wounded in that shootout, who was 19 years old, um, was to open that health clinic. And if you look at some of those tapes, they were so forward thinking, not only were they talking about, you know, sickle cell testing and lead testing and all of that, they were talking about mental health and trauma even then. So that idea of organizing folks around that need in that Rainbow Coalition, and by the way, one of the things that, that's not in the film is what happened after Fred was killed. When the cops were carrying Fred's body out, there's a picture of them uh, uh, taken by the, you know, one of the Chicago newspapers that they're smiling with those uh, Chicago PD checkered hats. What they didn't show was that moments later, the streets of that community, right where Jalen is, got flooded by folks from the community saying, what have you done? And the pig police fled the scene and they didn't seal the apartment. And what the Panthers learned from, and we do say we stand on the shoulders, not only of Malcolm X, but the young brothers and sisters in the civil rights movement. Fred talks about it one line in the movie that they babysat Emmett Till. He was a neighbor in Maywood. And, and what they learned from Emmett Till's mother who did one of the most courageous revolutionary things a mother could do, leave the coffin open so they can see what happened to my son. She did that because she didn't want to see that happen to another black boy and 50,000 Chicagoans passed by. Think of that. This is pre-social media. This is 1956, 50, 55, 50,000 Chicagoans passed by. And it was in every black paper and a lot of the white papers. The Panthers had a tour where people came through the apartment and saw what had happened. And some of the people from the coalition, some young white filmmakers filmed it and they were able to say this was such a, 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 a tremendous shootout. Hanrahan has blood on his hands. He's not mentioned. He was the DA. Why all the bullet holes going inside, right? That coalition fought, rallied to fight for justice for Fred Hampton 
It's the same coalition that changed the elected the elected spear in Chicago, where aldermen and councilmen were elected, and where Harold Washington became the first mayor. So that is Fred Hampton's legacy. But also the lesson of that legacy is that ideas are good, but people's needs resonate with them. And the final thing that I want to share is the greatest lesson that I learned about organizing from Afeni Shakur, my big sister, who first tried to run me out to office because she thought I was too young to be there and then came my big sister for life. She said, Jamal, the goal of the Black Panther Party is not to make every man, woman, and child in the community a Panther. The goal of the Black Panther Party, the mission of the Black Panther Party, is to teach people the possibility of struggle and liberation by example. And if we do that, and if people are participating, remember, folks from the community worked in those breakfast programs, not just Panthers. Folks in the community volunteered at the health clinic. Folks in the community came to those liberation schools. So if we do our jobs, then the Black Panther Party will have made itself obsolete. Organizers, our goal is to lead, is to fight, but to involve the people so that we make ourselves obsolete. Not just because we achieve liberation, but because people become consciousness and they become revolutionaries and liberators from block to block, house to house, community to community. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for the word. Um, and then Marbre, if you could wrap us up if you have any thoughts on what's been shared today, but we'd also just like to hear more about um, the People's Coalition and the process that um, folks can get involved with. Yeah, so juicy. I'm just really moved um, by the gems that were dropped, but also the work folks are doing. So thank you all so much. Um, I think I want to just briefly say that I think the work of the People's Coalition, which is focused on this idea of how do we get rid of the 94 crime bill, um, of the overinvestment or the investment in policing, in cages, in caging people, um, in militarization, how do we start to stymie and stop the trillion dollar investment in, in the surveillance and the caging, the occupation of our neighborhoods? While I think, uh, Mr. Joseph said, we're really abandoning all the things the Panthers demanded. We don't have employment for all of our people. We don't have housing. We don't have shelter. We don't have land. We don't have food and bread. And so really the, the mission, the, the drive, the demands have not been met. And we continue to have a state that while it cuts the social safety net, while it cuts all of the provisions that we so need, healthcare, food, land, all of those things, while it cuts those, it continues to pour trillions of dollars every year in the criminalization of our people, the weaponization of our police forces, I mean, the cage of our people. And so this movement that I think People's Coalition for Safety and Freedom is really about is how do we start to roll that back? And not just the what, but the how. And I think that this was touched on that it's not enough to just change a law, um, to change a budget line item. We have to actually make sure that our people have power and shift power. Who makes decisions? The fact that, as Tracy said, the same people who wrote this bill are now the president and the head of the Senate. It's the same old white men who don't have to live through any of this, who make decisions about all communities, all blocks, all homes, and don't have to live with any of it. And so how do we start to shift the power out of these kind of these centers of power that are so removed from the daily experience of what it means to survive these policies? And so the people's process is not just about kind of the what, but also the how. And we're engaging in at least a year long process in at least 10 to 20 communities across the country to have democratic processes to decide what keeps us safe. And we know that it's not the police, it's not cages, it's not big guns, um, that it is things like food and shelter, it is things like mutual aid and support, it is things like healthcare and mental health support. And so I think building on this legacy and these demands, how do we engage in a process that reflects our values and our politics? And to us, that's about people's movement assemblies, it's about engaging folks where they're at, I think as uh, Mr. Joseph said, kind of organizing around needs, but also recognizing that we're experts, that those of us who've had to survive these systems are the experts in both the diagnosis of the problem, but also the solution. So how do we start to really empower and support our own experts in writing the policies that it will save us? And we have put too much power and given too much power to the same people, the same, I think, rich white <laughs> men who get to live in DC and tell us how we should live. And it's time for us to grapple back the power. And so I think really we're continuing so much of the legacy and the values um, that the chairman and I think the veteran Black Panthers really embody around a how do we have democratic processes that not that not just remake the outcomes but actually the whole process so this system is guilty not just because of where it lands because of who gets to decide along the ways and what processes we engage in and so I think the coalition really wants to think about how do we meet folks where they're at and really um, indulge in and support the expertise of our people who are in the streets who are living these policies who know what's best who knows what keeps them keeps them safe and how do we 
repo resources into that. And so we're really excited. We're actually at the point right now of identifying locations where we can start to do this organizing around um, A, naming what the problems are with the crime bill and this decade long obsession and investment in criminalization in cages, and then B, start to imagine the solutions. And we I think we know this is housing and employment and healthcare, but how do we start to move money and budgets to reflect those priorities and those solutions? And so we're incredibly excited. Um, we know this is, this is, um, this is new and that it's bold, it hasn't been done before. Policy has happened in DC and in these spheres for too long and we want our power back. And so um, we are just now beginning. I think we're gonna drop the website for folks to, to sign up. If you are interested in hosting or, or just learning more about what it means to actually um, start to operate and think through how do we actually uh, put in place new systems of making policy that are relevant and resonate with us and our people and where we can have the power to actually change outcomes. And so if that appeals to you, if you wanna know more about how to organize your communities, how to engage in this process, please join us. I think we really are excited about um, laying new groundwork. I think there was a, in the beginning of the movie, there's a speech that the chairman gives around uh, revolution versus reform. And for too long, we've been inside of these dead end reforms. We give more and more money to police to surveil with new technology. We're not making actual kind of radical changes to these systems and the time I think really is now. And so that requires changing not just the laws, but also how we make them. So check us out. I think that Kamal used to talk a bit about the websites to click on and the forms to fill out, but we really, this is an open invitation around how do we actually engage ourselves, our people and our communities in a process of remaking these policies that for so long um, have destroyed us. Quick closing thought. I promise it'll be quick. No, please. Uh, when you talk about the, 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 the legacy of the, uh, of the Black Panther Party, um, you, we worked hard and that was the majority of your day from the breakfast program to if you were organizing a building and, and helping people do a rent strike and rebuild that building because the money had been put in escrow and we were doing that or if you were at a welfare center or just that, that's what your work was. But we studied, there was political education class almost every night. And it would be brilliant to see people who were students working with people who had come out of prison to help them read. That's who we were. We were grassroots folks. It was students. It was people coming out of prison. It was welfare moms. It was people coming back from the war. It was what Fanon called the wretched of the earth. This is what Marx called the lumpen proletariat. It was the disenfranchised folks that came together. They had nothing to lose, but everything to gain. And yet the anger and the frustration and the despair that brought you into the Panther office was swept away by the true mission of the struggle. So if you ask any Panther, and listen, we studied, we studied Marx and Lenin and everybody had a copy of the Red Book and Fanon and Amakal Cabral, right? So you, you, and you needed to be that one person organized when you went out. So it wasn't just our people that were part of the Speakers Bureau, but ask any, and the 10 point program, of course, but ask any Panther veteran, this is, a, 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 a and you, you could tell them, Jamal Joseph told me of the Panther 21, told me to ask you this question because you're a Panther veteran. What's the one thing that you were taught to believe among all other things? And I know you studied a lot. I know there was a 10 point program in the 26 rules of discipline and brothers and sisters, comrades, he, she, they, I guarantee the answer will be something like this. We were taught to have an undying love for the people and to serve the people, mind, body, and soul. And as Che Guevara says, real revolutionaries are guided not by hatred, not by anger, but great feelings of love. Ashe, thank you. That was a beautiful note um, to wrap us up with. I am personally overwhelmed with excitement and love. Um, and so I just want to- oh, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, and I think I- Pass it over to Kamal and uh, my friend. Peace, everybody. Uh, I'm also like trying to collect myself. Really emotional hearing all of this wisdom, uh, this incredible organizing lineage. So thank you for with your tonight. I also just want to say thank you to everybody for joining us. I know that there's a lot going on in now. Uh, and so taking the time out to be with us is greatly appreciated. I have like a couple of things to wrap us up uh, before folks head into the, the film screening. I just like plug one more time. We have the viewing guide I dropped it in the chat. Folks on the over the course of this call tonight heard about uh, COINTELPRO, 
heard about the 10 point program. If you want to learn more about that, feel free to check out the guide. It's also going to be distributed to everybody that signed up for this event. So uh, keep an eye. I also want to say thank you to Pint Media for giving us an opportunity to provide screening for participants, uh, which is uh, really exciting for us. So thank them for, for sharing that opportunity. And lastly, I just want to give one final plug for the people's process that Marbury mentioned. I'm going to drop one more time into um, the website that you can join us at because this spring we're really going to turn up and get our organizing together going around the country talking about folks need and what the demands look like and how we can make it happen. So with that said, I want to give a couple of minutes to catch your breath, uh, dry your eyes if you're like me and prepare for the screening at seven o'clock. Everybody that registered for this event should have gotten information about how to view the screening. And so please follow those instructions. Thank you so, so much for joining us and we'll talk to you soon.